What is going on as always, it's the next big thing, once again back with another spectacular Star vs. episode analysis. So to start it all off, we first have the episode Beach Day right before Gone Baby Gone. Then let's uh, stop all the chatter and cue the intro. In the beginning, we finally have Star and Marco relaxing watching television together while eating a stack of pancakes. And this is funny because this is about the second or third time so far that Marco was interrupted in the middle of his pancake eating in order to continue with an adventure involving Star. But I'm skipping ahead a tad bit. Let me just go back before this event happened. So as they're watching the marathon of youths, Marco's mother walks in and informs Star about her bathing suit being in the back of the freezer. Then afterwards, Star notices the different signs from the beach day photo. The beach ball in the corner, Raphael's camera, even though we clearly see her take her very own. One extra detail that Star mentions is that Marco had a zit on his nose, much like the one in the Beach Day photograph, which is something I'm positive was put in the description for this episode for fans to not have to inspect Marco each day to see if he has a zit there or not. Anyways, to no surprise, Star once again goes out of her way to make sure that the event happens, and even when it seems as if the universe itself won't allow it. First, they attempt to get there with a taxi. <laughs> Cars make me sick. But it's totally worth it for Beach Day. How's that for a shortcut, Mr. Driver Man? Put my car down. What was that? I said, put my car down. <laughs> Whoa, man, calm down. Technically, it's not like you're an Uber. The car clearly is labeled as a cab car, but I guess he was mainly upset since he could still get fired for damaged property, I suppose. So the next step was to use Cloudy the Cursor. <laughs> But that doesn't work out either, because eventually Star decides to instead let something random happen to determine their next move, which suddenly works after a seagull leads them to the beach after stealing Marco's sandwich. They finally make it only to be discouraged with the fact that Star leaves her camera in the future photo inside of the angry cab driver's car. But Marco convinces Star to try and have a great time together while they're there, and the beach was perfect. And after some time, it's revealed that an elderly woman snaps a picture of the two while having some fun, unintentionally posing the same exact way as in the photograph. At first, it's a celebration for the both of them knowing that it actually happened, however, after a while, Star goes into the time dimension to find Father Time, and explains to him that she wasn't exactly her happiest during that moment of time, unlike the photo seems to entitle at first glance. Plus, Father Time responds by saying that he didn't give it to Star, and that technically she gave it to her past Star in order for her to feel better and motivated each day. Ultimate proof of this working for past Star to have lived herself was Star Crush when she looked at it on the fridge before asking advice from her friends on what to do after the incident that was Song Day. It was kind of confusing at first to say the least, but it's understandable. Time paradoxes can be freaking confusing. Towards the end, we have Marco explaining to Star that she made up her own happiness, despite it feeling more of a lie, which clearly did help her through tough situations. Plus, while he's talking, he's working on a mermaid Ludo from what it seems, and I believe that it resembles the high possibility of the writers and or storyboard artists hinting a potential future of Ludo joining forces with Star and Marco for the greater good. I predicted this in the last episode analysis covering over Ludo, and honestly, that would be awesome for him to be an addition to the team. Now, don't think that I left this one last part before ending this part of the analysis because, oh, ho, ho, ho. no, I didn't. You see, before Star returns back onto the beach, Father Time says this. Bye, Father Time. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Too bad the hardest times are still ahead. Oh, what was that? Nothing. <laughs> That was an extremely dark warning said by Father Time, and this guy obviously knows his stuff, but I left that part of the episode for last in order to transition to the next episode, Gone Baby Gone. Literally in the beginning of the episode, Marco is telling both Mariposa and Meteora a story about how some people in the end had as many breakfast burritos as they wanted. And I also totally realized after watching this scene a second time that Mariposa was wearing pajamas similar to Star's original shirt with a pink alien. And wait... Mary Post's pajama shirt included a planet that I think was Saturn. So wait, is this their way of conveying that Star and Mariposa are similar in certain ways, or maybe that Star is the true alien on Mariposa's planet known as Muni? 
I don't know where I'm going with this, but let me just continue on, I guess. Plus, I mentioned this in my last episode analysis video, but in case some of you haven't heard, Mary Post's name in Spanish translated means butterfly, so... I don't know that she could be in relation with the butterflies, the true butterflies. Just moments later, after Marco sets the babies back into their cribs, or at least he did for Mariposa, Hekapu comes in to warn Marco to remain on Earth due to the high risk of something bad going to happen on Muni. This is most likely a reference to Mita Loveberry potentially making her first strike towards Eclipsa and her soon to be successfully finished with building Mutapin's Day Doomsday Plan. Now, that's not what they titled it in the episode. They didn't title it anything, but, um... <laughs> I just titled it that because it sounds awesome. I really doubt that Eclipsa is the one who to be feared by. She just got the people to come over to her side and managed to get Globcore freed. Even though in a recent episode, her spells did steal another spell that was one of her most powerful ones, so I don't know. But continuing onward, Marco tells Star about the warnings of the future attack on Muni and then remembers that she had to take a picture of the babies for Eclipsa, only to find out that they're both gone with Hakapu's dimension portal still remained open. So they're best in a luckiest bet would be to attempt to find them through Hekapu's dimension. The main question is, well, how did they both manage to escape through the portal? Surely it was due to Marco leaving Meteora on the floor after picking up Mariposa instead, which then led to Meteora probably using her magic to bring her alongside with her through the dimensional portal. Plus, if you were to remember earlier on when Hekapu was trying to heed her warning towards Marco, Marco pushed her out of the room where the babies were and the portal in order to tell him of the secrets of what's going on with Muni. So after her making the second portal, she forgot all about the first one, and I'm pretty sure that's just what what happened. So, they entered the Never Zone to summon Brunzetta for guidance, and that's about it. She wasn't able to see Marco for centuries, and this is what she was summoned for. Also, she apparently had no memories of Star since it's been centuries. You look so cool! Duh. <gasps> Did you miss me? I'm sorry, who are you again? Star was only in one adventure out of the multiple ones Marco and Brunzetta went on, so it made perfect sense. They then make it up the hill to meet up with the wise woman, only to be immediately ambushed by the girls themselves. They almost have a magic fight until Mariposa calls it off after realizing that Star is a magic user as well. Eventually, they take it out and try to convince them that they know each other, but it doesn't work. However, Mariposa and Meteora decide to take them over for dinner, but before Marco can get a chance to make it inside, he experiences this encounter with Meteora. Uh, can I help you? I don't know why, but something about you makes me angry. <laughs> that right there confirms that she has some faint memories about Marco from her past life as heinous. Finally, the theory has been confirmed. So they're then given their soups filled with spiders, skin flakes, garlic chowder, and um... <clears throat> Poison! But Marco somehow finishes his bowl since it would occasionally be what he would eat in order to survive. But both Star and him are then unconscious and taken up a mountain to sacrifice Star to a magic sucker known as Y-Scan. And one major thing that I kept thinking about after watching the episode, I just realized the fact that if they really needed Star and her magic, why the heck did they even try to bring Marco up there up the hill as well? But I guess it was convenient to the plot considering the fact that Marco had to wake up and warn the girls of what not to do. By the way, the character design for Y-Scan was admittedly great and he kind of reminded me of the elf from Dungeons Dungeons and more Dungeons from Gravity Falls. The game is like over. Excelsi whatever. Meteora and Mariposa were going to use Star as a magic sacrifice in order to make a deal with him so that he may grant Mariposa magical abilities like Meteora. And fun fact is that Meteora was taught by elderly folk in this dimension on how to use her powers. However, once again, I definitely feel as if what Glosserk was teaching her early on in the season to dip down was what got her to have the ability to turn into her Muberty form. They're then interrupted by Marco after miraculously awaking from his poison slumber, which gets a hold of Mariposa knowing that what she was doing was wrong. This, I bet, wasn't easy for her, since continuing to do so would mean that she would no longer have a chance to wield magic. And just because she can't do magic doesn't automatically mean that she can't still be a human, people. I thought about that too. Nothing shall get in the way of my theory. Nothing. So they instead decide to fight the demon the old fashioned way and to protect each other and defeat him with spiders. <laughs> 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 I actually rather like garlic. Spiders, on the other hand, ruin everything. <laughs> oh, 
Take your magic girl and go, you awful children. They're still crawling. <laughs> Why? After the battle, they're still not convinced that they're telling the truth, but then the necklace from the beginning that Mariposa is wearing, what Marco used to remind her of the story about the breakfast burritos, sets her off. And so they finally believe them. However, they still feel more comfortable being with one another since they're already adjusting. And that is until Star and Marco tell them about the wonders of food on Earth. Because hallelujah, why would you have skin flakes when you can just have corn flakes? And why eat a bunch of crawling alive spiders when you can eat, um, meat? Meatballs, I guess. And I guess both Star and Marco will be familiar about that feeling since they both were on Muni for about a year and having Earth food versus corn related stuff is a much better deal. So they make it home only to live happily ever after once they also were told that they will continue to be a family and that they won't be separated. I truly wonder if they'll somehow be brought back to the Never Zone because it would be great to see them help fight off villains with Star and the gang. I honestly don't know how that would work out, but Meteora even admits to Mariposa sometimes getting the best of her in battle, much like how Marco would win over Star. These two episodes were great and all, but the next one's titled Sad Teen Hotline and Jananigans sounds even better. And I would just lay out the description of both of these episodes for you right here, but I don't want to be the one to spoil it out for you. I want you guys to research it for yourselves. Especially the one titled Sad Teen Hotline. Very interesting. So once again, this has been your beautiful host, The Next Big Thing, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace!